The uh, Tale of the Clothier and the Vizier, Constantinople, 1641, um, Jewish roles in the royal courts of power. What do we see from that response? Oh, yeah, that is that is probably my favorite out of the whole collection, partly because the story is just so uh, it's such a narrative. It's told in such a style that I think I mentioned in my introduction, it almost seems like uh, out of the, the thousand and one nights, uh, you know, the, the stories that wanders from this point to that. Um, I want to say that uh, my colleague at the Hebrew University, Yaron Ben Na'eh, wrote uh, a, a very important article what i think he, he he could have made it into into a book uh su such rich material about um sephardic court jews long before there were ashkenazi court jews or at least somewhat before um there were sephardim who were important court jews who uh served various viziers and and uh uh, the sultans of the Ottoman Empire and the various um, governors of, of the, uh, the states uh, under a Muslim control, uh, many of these people. And so this is a story about one of those people. This is a man who uh, back in, um, uh, in Istanbul, which the Jews continue to call Kushta or Constantinople, uh, he has a store. It's a store in the Shuk, whatever. Uh, there was no Walmart, right? You couldn't go to uh, to Walmart or to Target and and walk in and find everything you need in one place and buy it. It's uh, right little stores, each one having the special uh, merchandise that that person was able to get, and some were better, some were not as good at getting the interesting merchandise. And this man had a store where he had some nice stuff, and. Uh, this uh, uh, officer from the uh, from the government used to come in and buy all his stuff from this guy. He liked, I don't know what, the cloths that he had for his wife and the jewelry and I don't know what all. So uh, this man uh, rose up in the government and became uh, ever more successful. And um, he... Um, he continued to buy from this man until he was uh, he became a very important figure in the government. And he took this man that he had met from his little store in the Shuk, and he made him uh, his uh, sarafashi, his, his, the head of his household, in charge of buying everything that he needed for the household. And eventually the man is uh, given a, a super important post. Oh, before that happens, the guy, uh, right, he takes a dive. The, um, the sultan, or whoever it is, uh, feels that this man has been implicated in some scandal. I don't know what it is. And it looks like he's going down, right? He's exiled and his Jewish uh, uh, merchant uh, servant, uh, he, he doubles down. He gives the guy stuff, food and clothes and so on to take with him into exile and so on. It could have, it could have been a complete bust. This man might have died in exile and, uh, this this merchant would have been out everything, uh, but it doesn't happen that way uh, for whatever reason. And again, we have no idea why, but the governor, the vizier uh, the, or the, um, the, the sultan uh, reverses his decision about this uh, officer and brings him back. And he is thrilled with his Jew. The Jew stood by him when everybody else abandoned him. His Jew stood by him and supplied him with what he needed on credit, of course, right? Because the man's uh, fortunes had been destroyed. And now he's back and this Jew is in his good graces. The man is appointed to be the governor of Egypt. And of course, he brings the Jew along and the Jew is at the top of his game, right? Supplying the governor of Egypt and, and overseeing his household. Uh, but now another Jew tries to horn in on the action, right? He wants to be uh, the uh, sarafashi uh, for this guy and uh, supply the household with, uh, with the things and make a ton of money. And he gets in good with other people at court and they support the other guy. And this guy is furious because he went through so much to support this 
this governor and the two Jews, right? The the the, the rest of the uh, Sheila, the west the rest of the question is about these these two Jews uh, jockeying for position at court and and uh, the the various um, compromises and fights and so on that they have about who is going to oversee that household. Uh, so the story is just told in a uh, a leisurely and, uh, and and fascinating way. And one of the reasons that it may be is that when a book of Sheilot de Chuvot, a book of uh, rabbinic responsa, uh, was published back in the 16th or 17th centuries, of course, the purpose of it wasn't for some future historian to read the stories. There was no such thing as a historian, right? Uh, it was for uh, rabbis and uh, Talmud students to study the case as a, a, as case law to see how the rabbi adjudicated the case. So typically, what they would do is they would shorten the question to the minimum elements, uh, often taking out names and places and so on, and it would be truncated because the question wasn't the important part. It just needed the elements that would be relevant to the halakhic decision. This uh, book, uh, this volume of Rabbi Yoshua ben Venisti, uh, the brother of, of uh, Rabbi Chaim ben Venisti, the famous uh, uh, Knesset Sagadola. Uh, so these were uh, found relatively recently in manuscript. And of course, when modern people publish these books, they recognize the value of the whole uh, the whole work, and and it all goes in. And so you have, in many cases, not in every case, but in many cases, a much fuller narrative, a much fuller version of the question that was asked. So those are particularly useful for the historian.